Good evening, everybody. Before we get started, I'd like to welcome Pastor, Pastor Jason Howard from Stone Creek Church here in Milton to lead us in our invocation. Right, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. Let's bow our heads as we uh, enter into a time of prayer. And Heavenly Father, tonight as we look at this season of Thanksgiving, um, Father, I just pray that we would appreciate the blessings that you have given us um, as individuals, as family members, um, and also as a city. You know, Father, that we would never rest um, on the blessings that we've been given. We wouldn't be satisfied, but that we would you know, look to use what we've been given in order to abundantly grow and, and to do more. And as we do that tonight, uh, Father, with the business that's before this council, I pray for our Mayor Jill Lockwood and Councilwoman Thurman, Councilman Hewitt, Longoria, Kuntz, Lusk, and Morig to govern us well. Um, ask that you graciously grant them a sense of welfare and the true needs for our people and also confidence in to do what is good and fitting for our city. And Father, as we close, we pray for the agenda set before them. Please give them an assurance of what would please you, what would benefit those who live and work in and around Milton, the best city in Georgia. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much. Okay, I'd like to call the regular meeting of the Milton City Council for Monday, November 21st, 2016 to order. Judy, if you'll please call the roll and make general announcements. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'll be happy to call roll for the November 21st, 2016 regular meeting. I would like to remind those in attendance to please silence all cell phones at this time. Those attending the meeting who would like to provide public comment, either during the public hearing or during the call for public comment, you are required to complete a public comment card prior to speaking on the item. There is no public comment for consent agenda items or items under first presentation. Those called to speak will be taken in the order that the speaker cards are received by the city clerk prior to the beginning of tonight's meeting. All speakers will identify themselves by name, address, and organization if applicable. The city council may allow public comment on either an agenda item or general public comment from a representative of such an organized group or association, provided that the individual shall file a notarized affidavit that they have the authority to speak on behalf of said organization on a form provided by the city clerk prior to the agenda item being called. Demonstration of any sort within the chamber is prohibited, so please refrain from any applause, cheering, booing, outbursts, or dialogue with any person speaking. Please show the same respect to the person speaking that you will expect to receive yourself. Anyone in violation will be asked to leave. As I call roll this evening, please confirm your attendance. Mayor Joe Lockwood. Here. Councilmember Karen Thurman. Here. Councilmember Bill Luss. Here. Councilmember Bert Hewitt. Here. Councilmember Rick Morick. Here. For the record, Councilmember Joe Longoria is running late, and Councilmember Matt Kuntz is absent. Would everyone please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, Good evening, everybody. I want to welcome you here tonight and uh, also offer our con condolences to uh, Councilmember Kuntz's 102 year old grandmother passed away. So, Sudi, if you will please sound the next item. Our next item is approval of the meeting agenda. This is agenda item number 16265. <laughs> Mayor, I'd like to move uh, agenda items numbers 16, 273, and 16, 274 to follow, uh, to follow the reports and presentations. Yeah, we've got a match of the consent agenda, but yeah, we're good. Okay. Okay. Um, I'd also want to add an executive, executive session to discuss land acquisition. Uh, is there anything staff on the agenda for like change or council? Okay, I'll open up for a motion. Make a motion to approve the agenda as modified with the addition of executive session for land acquisition purposes. Okay. I have a motion by <clears throat> Councilmember Hewitt, second by um, Councilmember Thurman. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That's unanimous. Okay. Who, um, 
Next item is public comment. Do we have any public comment? Yes, sir. Okay. Public comment is a time for citizens to share information with the mayor and city council and provide input and opinions on any matter that is not scheduled for its own public hearing during today's meeting. There's no discussion on items on the consent agenda <clears throat> or first presentation from the public or from council. Each citizen who chooses to participate in public comment must complete a comment card and submit it to the city clerk. Please remember this is not a time to engage the mayor or members of city council in conversation. When your name is called, please come forward and speak into the microphone stating your name and address for the record. You will have five minutes for remarks. Okay, so if you please call the public comment. Uh, we have one public comment this evening from Mr. Tim Becker. Good evening, Council. Tim Becker, 15625 Canterbury Chase. Tonight I want to address the approval of the Hopewell Road subdivision plat on November 7th. The Hopewell decision was an unequivocal demonstration of special treatment for special interests. I attended all the meetings where the platting was discussed, and I can tell you that no substantive information was provided between the first and second hearings. Nonetheless, three council members changed their votes, resulting in the approval of the platting. And we all know the reason why. We all know that a wealthy campaign donor and developer with an interest in the platting was in the room on November 7th. And that made all the difference. Citizens are not naive. Your fellow council members are not naive. The Hopewell Road plat approval process was wrong in so many ways and on so many levels. First, there should have never been a second hearing. Land use hearings are quasi-judicial or court-like proceedings. In a court, you get one chance to plead your case. Judges get one op opportunity to question litigants. Litigants do not get a second hearing in the same court. Similarly, developers in Milton should only get one chance to plead their case. At the initial hearing, the applicant had an opportunity to make his case. He failed to do so. City council members also had an opportunity to thoroughly vet this issue at the first hearing. The platting was denied. That should have been the end of it. Revisiting the platting is inherently unfair to citizens. Unfortunately, in Milton, special interests get a do-over. Second, citizens had a right to know which council member put the platting back on council's agenda and why. At the second review, two of us requested to know the identity of the council member and his rationale for a second review. However, the council member in question lacked the courage to step forward Milton's equivalent of pleading the fifth. Third, developers must come to council with clean hands. One council member argued that developers des deserve to be treated ethically and with integrity. I agree, but only if those developers come to council with clean hands. We know that in this case, the developer was exploiting ambiguity in our laws, ambiguity that in Milton always gets interpreted in favor of developers. A developer is not entitled to obtain an equitable outcome if that developer has acted in bad faith. And such developers are certainly not entitled to a do-over. Lastly, I would contend that all three council members that reversed their votes should have recused themselves. All three have serious conflicts of interest of one sort or another. One council member who has received many thousands of dollars in campaign contributions from the development community has received nearly $2,500 from a developer that sat on the front row during the hearing. Why didn't that council member reveal this conflict? A council member that receives nearly $2,500 from a campaign donor and then votes on a matter before council in which that donor has an interest without recusing himself or even disclosing the $2,500 campaign contribution is unethical 
and dishonors Milton's citizens. It is clear that money greases the gears of government in Milton. In closing, I would remind council that money is not the measure of a man. Citizens do not like a rigged game. Citizens will not accept pay for play in Milton. We are better than that. Developers should not get a second hearing. Developers should come to council with clean hands. Council members should own up to their sponsorship of agenda items. Council members with conflicts of interest are obliged to reveal those conflicts and recuse themselves. Campaign contributions, business associations, and personal relationships should not sway council members. A citizen should receive the same treatment before council whether he drives here in a brand new Tesla or a 20-year-old Ford Escort. Special interests should not get first-class treatment while those of us at the back of the pl plane pay the price. There is a silver lining in the Hopewell Platt approval. Citizens now Mr. have Becker, a clear your time has elapsed. Now have a clear case study of the blatant influence of special interests and money in Milton. Thank you. Okay, City, do we have any more public comment? That's all, sir. Okay, next item we'll move on to our consent agenda. If you will uh, please read the consent agenda items. First item is approval of the September 7th, 2016 regular city council meeting minutes. Agenda item number 16266. Next is approval of a governmental lease agreement for lighting services between Georgia Power and the city of Milton to provide street lighting and parking lot lighting for City Hall. Agenda item number 16267. Our third and final consent agenda item this evening is approval of a construction services agreement between the City of Milton and Triscapes, Inc. for the construction of two bridges and removal of the dock at Providence Park. Agenda item number 16268. Mayor, I'll move to approve the consent agenda as prepared by staff. Second. I have a uh, motion for approval and a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That's unanimous. Okay. We changed on our agenda to move to item number 16-274. Sudi, if you would please call that on. Okay, do we want to do reports and presentations first or um, go to the... We can, uh, we could do that. To go back here, let's see. Next item is presentation of the Georgia Recreation and Parks Association State Volunteer Award, Mr. Jim Craig. City of Milton is a member of the Georgia Recreation and Parks Department, uh, Parks Association, and we compete for awards at the district as well as the state level. And this year we have an award winner for volunteer of the year, not only at the district seven level, but at the state level as well. And to present the award here, we have the uh, Support Services Director of Cobb County, Mr. Eddie Kennan. For those who don't know, <laughs> these two guys were college roommates years ago. Uh, he didn't have a clue I was going to be here. So it's, it's definitely my pleasure to be at the city of Milton, to, Milton tonight. Um, I grew up in Roswell, so I hung around a little bit in the Milton area, so uh, a lot of good friends over the years, the city of Milton. But y'all have done an amazing job um, with your Parks and Recreation Department. Uh, Jim, his staff, and the volunteers, the council should be very proud of what you have. They've done a super, super job. On behalf of the Georgia Recreation and Parks Association and our president, Robbie Newton, it is my pleasure to be able to present a special award tonight. Each year at our state conference, we present Volunteer of the Year awards to folks from around the state that do an unbelievable job in their community to make a difference. Um, this year, uh, one of your own has been recognized with their effort with the city of Milton. Ken Sisson has served the city of Milton as a member of the Hopewell Youth Association Board. The last three years serving as president, Ken has been, a vi been vital in the continued success 
of the recreation side of baseball. While others focus on travel, select, and elite levels of play, Ken made sure the participants that truly wanted to learn the game of baseball and enjoy just being having the experience had a place to play. During the time that Bell Memorial Park was closed for renovations, Ken, Ken kept the program alive and moving forward. By the way, Bell Memorial Park, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. Y'all need to be proud of that also. During the time that the Hope, Hopewell Youth Association, they donated $100,000 to help the cost of the park project, and a lot of that was because of Ken's efforts. The park is now reopened and the program is flourishing. Ken has handed the program off to a new group of parents, and because of him, there are many kids that will enjoy youth sports because of his dedication to the program. It is an unbelievable pleasure and an honor to be able to present the GRPA Volunteer of the Year to Mr. Ken Sisson. Last time I was here, I was giving you all that check for $100,000. I was hoping I was going to give it back. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a, quite a surprise we see Eddie here. We, we go back 30 or, 30 or 40 years, uh, went to college together, and did a lot of other things. Uh, um, I, you know, uh, enjoyed serving the community and uh, glad to see. I wish I'd got to participate a little bit more in the new Bell Memorial Park. It certainly is great. And uh, uh, we had a lot of fun in the old one. And, uh, um, Glad to see the things up and running. Uh, we are getting to play in a little bit. My son plays lacrosse out there now, so he's kind of aged out of baseball. But uh, um, thanks for this, and uh, um, thank you all for letting me uh, work at the park. Sure. The council want to come down and we'll get Eddie and Ken in the picture. Again, thank you very much, Ken. We appreciate all our volunteers. You guys make a big difference. All right, today, as we changed our agenda, if we could move to uh, item 16274. Uh, this is consideration of a resolution appointing a member to the City of Milton Cultural Arts Committee for District 1, Post 2. Agenda item number 16273, Mayor Joe Lockwood. Okay, we'll turn it over to Council Member Lux. It's actually uh, the other agenda item, oh, 274. You know what, I'm on the second one, 274, yeah. 273. All right. Council Member Hewitt. So I'm uh, pleased to bring uh, Megan Jamison's name to the Sculptural Arts Committee. She's, uh, <coughs> everybody in the room knows her. They're, she and her husband are very well involved and their three kids as well in the city. And she's the best artist I know in Milton. <laughs> graduate of Auburn University, so I'd like to bring Megan's name uh, for consideration, please. Wow. All right, I'll open up for a motion. Mayor, I'll make a motion that we approve agenda item number 16 273. Second. Yeah, a motion by Councilmember Thurman, second by Councilmember Long Gregoria. <coughs> All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That's unanimous. And she'll come get sworn in at a sure. future meeting. No problem. All right, so if you call her next time. Next item is consideration of a resolution appointing a member to the City of Milton Cultural Arts Committee for District 2, Post 1. Agenda item number 16274, Mayor Joe Lockwood. Okay, I'll turn this over to Council Member Lusk. Thank you. <clears throat> At this time, I'd like to uh, propose uh, approval of uh, Bill Purdy uh, as a member of the Arts Council. Uh, Bill's been a uh, resident of Melton since 1987 
and uh, he's been a member of the literary group since its inception. Uh, he's also a member of the Atlanta Working Title Play Playwrights Group. What's more, he is author of a romantic jukebox musical comedy. It's a two-act stage play promoted by the recent Milton Literary Arts Festival and tentatively scheduled for premiere in the summer of 2017. Bill's uh, been a business owner here in Milton for 35 years. He sold his business uh, three years ago and retired. Uh, he's always been interested in live theater and has supported the theater in Roswell for over 22 years. Uh, his goal is to create a database of theater talent within the community, explore the creation of a Milton Community Theater to establish interest in the performing arts in our city and to produce family-oriented entertainment showcasing local talent. <clears throat> he builds partnerships with local organizations with performing arts venues to stage plays for our community. And his long-term goal is to have uh, our own cultural arts center here in the city of Milton look at that one. <clears throat> um, so I'd, I'd recommend and request that we approve uh, Bill Party as uh, member of the uh, City of Milton Cultural Arts Com uh, Committee. Uh, he's here tonight with his wife Ruby and uh, with the mayor. Uh, sure. Sure. I'll uh, open up for a motion. I move that we uh, accept the nomination. And approve Joe Purdy. Second. Okay. We have a motion from Councilmember Longor. Second for uh, uh, from uh, Councilmember Rick Morig. And uh, for the uh, appointing That's Bill it. Purdy for this position. So all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That's unanimous city. Yeah, Bill. So, sorry, I got your name wrong. And uh, Bill, if you'll uh, come forward and we'll swear to you in. Raise your right hand and repeat after me. I do solemnly swear and affirm. I do solemnly swear and affirm that I will faithfully perform the duties. That I will faithfully perform the duties of the Milton Cultural Arts Committee. Of the Milton Cultural Arts Committee of the city. Of the city. And that I will support and defend the charter thereof. And I will support and defend the charter thereof. As well as the Constitution. As well as the Constitution. And the laws of the state of Georgia. And the laws of the state of Georgia. And the United States of America. Thank you, Bill. And if uh, the council would uh, join us in uh, this party, join us and we'll get a picture. Okay. Okay, City, our next item's first presentation. If you'll please read those items. Consideration of an ordinance reaffirming and establishing Chapter 46 of the Milton Code of Ordinances governing solid waste collection services within the city of Milton. Agenda item number 16269. 
Our second and final first presentation item this evening is consideration of amendments to Chapter 20, Soil Erosion, Sedimentation and Pollution Control, Article 6, Soil Erosion within the City of Milton Code of Ordinances. Agenda item number 16270. Okay, we have a motion and a second on the first presentation items. Mayor, I move that we accept the first presentation items as read by the city clerk. Second. <coughs> I have a motion from Councilmember Longoria, second from Councilmember Thurman. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That's unanimous. We'll, uh, next, we'll move on to our public hearing. Uh, city, if you'll please sound the first item. This is consideration of an ordinance to amend Chapter 2, Article 8, Ethics Code of the City of Milton Code of Ordinances. Agenda item number 16, 245, discussed under new business at the October 17th meeting. Mr. Ken Gerard. Mr. Mayor, Member of the Council, good evening. This is a public hearing with respect to a proposed modification of the City of Milton's Ethics Ordinance. Uh, that would add a reimbursement provision for attorney's fees with respect to those uh, city officials or employees that may be the subject of ethics complaints in the city of Milton. This has been something we have discussed not only in a work session but at prior uh, regular meetings as well. Uh, the language that uh, you have uh, authorized my office to prepare is in your agenda packet. If you look to the bottom of the page, you will see a proposed section 2897, and uh, because it's short, I will go over it with you very quickly. In the event an ethics complaint brought against the respondent, the respondent would be in this situation either the employee or the city official, arising out of the official duties, and that is important, the ethics complaint obviously has to be tethered to some sort of an official action, official duties of the employee or the official, is dismissed. If in fact the complaint is dismissed, and you'll see a parenthetical there, by either voluntary withdrawal of the complaint by the petitioner or by action of the ethics panel or superior court. The respondent shall be entitled to reimbursement from the city for reasonable attorney's fees incurred in defending the ethics complaint upon securing a final determination by the ethics panel or superior court of the complaint being dismissed, and I am skipping over a few words for uh, efficiency. The respondent shall submit a copy of the order making such finding or petitioner's withdrawal, whichever is applicable to the city manager along with a copy of the applicable itemized attorney's fees and occurred in defending same. And then the provision goes into the expectations with respect to the itemization of those fees. The city manager would then submit that fee statement to the city attorney for a determination of the reasonableness of those fees uh, and upon um, concurrence that the fees are reasonable then that would be sent back to the city manager and ultimately a check from the city finance department would be issued to that official that has been the subject um, of the complaint that has now been dismissed. In no event shall reimbursement under this paragraph exceed $5,000 per complaint. So again, the expectation here is, is that there is an ethics complaint filed against a city employee or a city official. Uh, the city attorney does not represent you in those sorts of situations. You would retain, if you feel so inclined, retain your own attorney. And if you prevail, that is key, because that is the only time this would uh, apply, if you prevail either by a dismissal or by a finding of no merit to the complaint, then it sets up a process whereby you can uh, petition the city uh, to seek reimbursement for any attorney's fees that you have been required to uh, to incur up to $5,000. This is a public hearing only right now. Uh, actually, action on this will occur at a later part of your agenda. Mr. Mayor? Do we have any public comments, City? Yes, sir, we do have one. Okay. And that's from Mr. Tim Becker. Tim Becker, 1565 Canterbury Chase. Good evening, Council. I oppose the ordinance to amend the ethics code. I would support a more narrowly written ordinance. I recently attended an ethics hearing where the ethics panel dismissed a complaint after about 20 minutes of discussion. The eth ethics panel quickly realized the ethics complaint was frivolous. The, the right outcome was achieved. Fortunately, in this situation, the city only incurred the cost of the ethics panel. However, under the pr proposed ordinance, the city might have incurred 
up to $5,000 in additional expenses if the defendant had engaged a lawyer. Is it really prudent for the city to expose itself to the risk of such expenses for frivolous complaints that will be summarily dismissed? Consideration should also be given to the likelihood that most citizens making an ethics complaint will not hire a lawyer. Is it really prudent for the city to pay legal expenses in such situations where there is no lawyer on the plaintiff's side? Will citizens be reluctant to file ethics complaints knowing that they will be outgunned by the accused legal counsel? Also, is the city willing to reimburse up to $5,000 for a plaintiff's legal counsel if the plaintiff prevails in an ethics hearing? Does fairness require such compensation? Shouldn't we reimburse a citizen that exposes a legitimate ethics violation and prevails at an ethics hearing? And isn't it the case that the ethics panel might already be implicitly biased by the fact that the city is paying the fees of ethics panel members? Might they feel indirect pressure to rule in favor of the city? Do we need to further tilt the scales in favor of the accused by paying for the accused legal counsel? Lastly, I would point out that counsel's extending such protection to elected officials is not appropriate. Citizens generally do not look favorably on politicians conferring privileges and protections upon themselves. Given the points I made previously, a more sensible ordinance would contain the following elements. First, only non-elected city employees would be covered. Second, legal expenses would be provided for expenses occurred after an initial hearing and only if the plaintiff is also represented by legal counsel. And third, legal expenses up to $5,000 would be reimbursed for complainants that were successful with their complaints. In closing, I question why this issue is even a priority. In previous council discussions, I did not get a sense that ethic complaints were a serious issue for the city. And I am quite sure that no citizen would cite the city's lack of reimbursement as a serious issue facing the city. It seems to me that council has wasted a lot of time on an issue that citizens do not care about while dithering on issues that citizens do care about. Community septic, three acre minimums, and the tree ordinance have all been in play for nine months with no resolution in sight. In the meantime, an ethics ordinance that benefits elected officials but citizens could care less about has sailed through council in just a few months. And a developer recently got a rehearing on a subdivision plat just weeks after the same plat was denied. I urge council to reassess its priorities and to focus on the issues that citizens care about. The ethics ordinance is not one of those issues. The net effect of the proposed ordinance will be to discourage legitimate citizens' complaints and to reduce government <coughs> accountability and to further alienate government from citizens. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So do we have any more public comment? That's all, sir. Okay, I'll close the hearing. Um, any questions or comments from council? Joe. Ken. Sir. Uh, I know we talked. We started talking about this maybe two months ago. We had the content that was brought up in a work session. We discussed several aspects of this. Um, are we doing anything with uh, related to this that is beyond usual and customary when you compare the city of Milton with, let's say, our neighboring cities like Johns Creek and Roswell Alpharetta? Not that that's any reason to do it, but just from a comparison point of view. You know, Councilmember Longoria, we did look at some other, I can't, I can't sit here and speak to what Sandy Springs or Roswell or Johns Creek are doing. We did look at some other jurisdictions uh, like Kennesaw and Marietta and other jurisdictions and they have similar provisions like this. Kennesaw doesn't even have a cap on the uh, reimbursement exposure. Marietta has a cap going from either $7,500 all the way to $15,000. Forsyth County uses a $10,000 cap. 
Uh, I thought the, the city council, you know, was trying to be conservative, keeping it at five thousand dollar cap. I mean, it's, it's hard to get a great deal of attorney service for five thousand. Right. So, so I'm, I'm not going to say that there's anything uh, uh, terribly uh, unusual about what you're doing, but I cannot answer your direct question of what Johns Creek is. Doing. Okay, I, I don't want to necessarily get into what the original impetus was to bring this up because I, I don't remember. I, I think it made sense at the time, but I can't remember what it was. But just to be clear, there's nothing that compels either a council member or a city um, uh, employee to engage an attorney if, uh, if let's say, they decided, well, you know what, this is really frivolous. I know this, the, the complaint itself is not going to be something that we have to address. Now, while offering recompense, for engaging an attorney may be in of, of itself a reason to engage an attorney. There, there's nothing that compels, let's say, a council member from taking that action, correct? That's correct. And okay. obviously the individual that's the subject of the ethics complaint has to make that decision on their own. So, so I don't want to generalize, but this would be sort of a, this would be a plan for protecting an employer or government official uh, in the case that something gets sort of beyond their control and they believe that it's in their best interest to have that kind of counsel represent them. That's right. I mean, I, I think that's right. Um, obviously, it's, it's difficult for me to speculate how a counsel or an employee would respond to an ethics complaint. Uh, it's, it's difficult for any of us to do that until you're on the other side of one. And then, of course, you take it very seriously uh, I, I will be the first to tell you that I have seen ethics complaints that I thought were not, how about this, not going to be meritorious based upon the facts that I saw in the complaint. However, on the other hand, you know, m many elected officials, not just in Melton, but everywhere, I mean, their name is everything, and their reputation is terribly important. And so uh, they do take these. My experience has been every elected official I've ever worked with takes these complaints very seriously, and sometimes I will tell them, I don't think there's going to be much to that. It doesn't seem like it's an ethical conduct, and they will say, it doesn't matter to me. Well, to get back to a couple other comments that were made in preparation or, or in the open uh, hearing, um, we, we took action to put in place a – uh, ethics panel because the previous mechanism that we had in place after one try turned out to not be a very good idea. And so we thought the ethics panel was an improvement on the previous mechanism that we had in place. I concur. Okay. Now, there wasn't anything unusual about the way we put that panel together. Didn't we actually take a model from some of our mm -hmm. neighboring cities and counties? We, to we yeah, we did, and I can, t I can even tell you more than that. We took Forsyth County's model, and which has been, um, which has had quite a bit of activity, and, and I will tell you, I thought that model has worked very well. I mean, and again, you, if you think about it just from a pure utilitarian standpoint, you're talking about individuals that are presumed, and I'm, by the way, I'm not taking anything away from lay panels, the lay board before, but what I will say is, is that these are individuals that are presumably acquainted with the concepts of due process. They are acquainted with the notion of burdens of proof, and what I mean by that is attorney panels that have a certain uh, amount of civil uh, litigation experience. Uh, they are all uh, with offices outside of the jurisdiction, hopefully removing any sort of political um, elements from their consideration. And I thought it worked well to the north of us, and candidly, I think it works well here. In fact, many of the panel members may be the same. These are attorneys that have an interest in doing this. The panels are always selected randomly. Uh, by way of a drawing every time uh, an ethics complaint comes in, which obviously we hope uh, we don't have to deal with it too often. We hope that uh, there's an understanding of the, the city of Milton attempts to act ethically. So to the question about the uh, fact that we paid the panel to sit and listen, I mean, that really doesn't bias them in any way, does it, Kim? No. no. Uh, okay. With, with I mean, certainly with on the respect, surface I you could think that, that that's a possibility, but, I mean, attorneys – you know, understand that a lot better than most people. Well, uh, yeah, I, th I think that the, the per diem for their for fee, I mean, for instance, I've seen merit boards and civil service boards that also get per diem fees to try and compensate them for just for the actual expenses of the time uh, that they are out. But I have seen those same merit boards or civil service boards take it to the government uh, that is stroking that check. My point right. simply is, is that I, I don't think 
most of the individuals serving on that pay one whit of attention to the fact that they're getting 100 or 150 bucks uh, to sit there. Um, I think though these folks are trying to do what they think is the right thing. I, I would tell you differently if I thought otherwise. Yeah. The last question I'll ask, and sorry for so many questions, but uh, uh, the citizen brought up a, an interesting idea in terms of compensation for uh, expenses related to, you know, bringing something like this and against a city employee or council member or anything else, and, and the idea that um, we should be serving all citizens, not just some of the citizens, in that uh, is an interesting angle. I, I'll admit I had never thought of it before. Can you think of any examples where the city would actually pay for a citizen who brought forth an ex ethics complaint that was found to be true against a city employee or official? Well, I, I will tell you, you know, there's both state law, statutory concepts, and also case law that talks about elected officials, and by the way, not just in Milton, but throughout Georgia, are entitled to, um, in both indemnity, I mean, we have insurance policies, as does every jurisdiction, to protect individuals that are sued in their official capacity. And the public policy objective here is that if both employees or elected officials knew that they personally faced personal exposure from liability based upon their duties as an elected official, they simply would not serve. Um, and that's why not only are you provided uh, indemnity insurance, and you have every right to be invited to provide indemnity insurance, but also in many respects you're provided an attorney. The other way around, how would that work? Um, I can't rattle off the provisions to you right now, but I think there typically is a cost-shifting mechanism in the Georgia whistleblower statute uh, that if individuals come forward and truly provide information that helps uncover corruption or graft or uh, improper spending. I do think there may be some attorney fee shifting mechanisms in that. I can't recite them to you right now. If you right. wanted me to look at them, I could. But as far as paying individuals to bring ethics complaints, uh, I would simply worry about what the perverse sort of incentive that might bring would be. My yeah, and I'm not really thinking it's, it's not a fishing expedition. We're not looking for people to take the bait. I, no, I, but I, I mean, I got the point the speaker was made. I, I think that's why you're asking. I right. understood the point that was being made as if, you know, if the turnaround's fair play I, I, as well. Um, but while, whereas I think Georgia law does generally provide the notion that elected officials do get to get a, right. a paid for attorney in many situations where they're, where they're challenged in their official capacity, I don't think the law works that way with respect to the individual making the, the complaint. And in fact, in many instances, I agree with the speaker that the ethics complaints are brought by lay individuals uh, without the, the aid or assistance of an attorney. And I will tell you that when I have sat with training with some of the panel members, not in Milton, but in another jurisdiction, I will, I will tell you the ethics panel attorneys are very sensitive to the notion that it is typically unrepresented citizens that are bringing these complaints and they have then told me in response, therefore we want to give them a wide berth. And what I mean by that is, is we don't want to be too terribly exacting on the level that they are required to adhere to they're, because they're not represented. So my only point being is, is that the panel system I think provides several different checks. Uh, to include giving those citizens a wide berth. These panel members understand these folks are not represented and to the extent that they, they submit anything that even arguably looks like a claim of unethical conduct, you can expect they're going to take it very seriously. Well, to your point, uh, it's very common. I've served on plenty of boards and, and things where as an officer you have to be given that kind of protection because the job that you're doing just it requires it so listen I mean I've got individuals on library boards and park and rec boards and planning commissions they're always you 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 think they wouldn't be but they're very sensitive does this expose me to any personal liability right. and will I be protected and candidly if the answer to that was no then I think it would make some individuals think twice about serving yeah. and let me to, to that point Ken because <clears throat> as it was brought up you know, let's say it's a citizen that brought up the ethics charge, but they're not um, represented by a lawyer. But really, the only thing incumbent upon that said citizen would be to bring that fact, that charge to the city. Um, 
again, it's an outside panel that's going to review it. Correct. So I would think that our process through the city, it goes through a professional process to take it to the next level. And obviously it's incumbent upon our city staff, our city attorney to take it serious. So, you that's know, right. I would feel comfortable believing that it would get full uh, attention to it. Well, right. Uh, I mean, yeah, that's a great point. I mean, an ethics complaint is not the only means by which a citizen can provide allegations of unethical conduct. I think, my, you know, me as your city attorney, um, I have uh, state bar obligations uh, that control how I must act if I believe there is anything by a client. And remember who my client is. My client is the city of Milton government. It's uh, although the attorney-client privilege attaches to my communications with each of you, my allegiance is greater to the whole as opposed to the individual. So there's certain there's certain obligations I would have if I uh, was co uh, presented with information of unethical conduct uh, by you or or city staff, as would the city manager would also take that very seriously. And given his background, that he would probably take it more seriously with more exacting detail than than most would, because that's the world he came from. And I guess my point to that is if I, as a citizen, had something that I felt was unethical and I turned it in, Correct. that person shouldn't be expected or think that they need to have an attorney representing them. You know, obviously the, the accused, um, I see a need, uh, you know, could be a need for that. But, you know, again, anybody that it shouldn't, just because there's legal counsel for the accused, I don't believe should deter you know, a citizen from if they see something that they, you know, think, know, or perceive as unethical, should uh, stop them from. You know, it's interesting. I, I think you're right. I think, particularly with respect to just uh, setting forth a complaint for unethical conduct, I think the standard is fairly low. Don't get me wrong, there does need to be some evidentiary basis, there does need to be some affidavits and sworn statements. And the reason for that is, of course, is because of the serious nature of these sorts of complaints. I mean, this is. This is something can, that can be both damaging to the reputation of both the employee or the official and candidly can impugn the ability of the government to function in some situations. So it does need to be a serious process. But once that sort of a complaint is made, you're right, uh, particularly the initial threshold review, there's no need for a lawyer there because candidly no one gets to speak. Now if it does go to an actual bona fide hearing where due process, people get sworn in, there's actual evidence. Um, some individual citizens may, in fact, at that point, want the benefit of an attorney. But I will also tell you, having trained some of these panel members, they're going to run it a lot more like a magistrate court than a superior court, as we know, or forgive me, I'm in the city now, a city court, uh, as opposed to a superior court, where the rules of evidence will apply, but they're going to be loosely administered. You brought up, Ken, um, board members and that sort of thing. So their, our appointed board members are bound by the same code of ethics they as are. the city staff and yes, the council sir. officials are. So an ethics charge could be brought up against those folks as well. And this, yes. this affords them some, some peace of mind, like you said. Is that it correct? Does. It would. Yes, sir. And I, I mean, almost liken it to insurance on your car, your automobile. Just because you have insurance, you're not going to drive. You're still going to probably drive safe. You know, plan, you're not going to plan on having an accident or do something wrong versus if you didn't have any insurance, you probably don't want to get in the car. Actually, okay. Mr. Mayor, it's, it's interesting. Uh, years ago, uh, the reason you could not present evidence of automobile insurance uh, in some uh, situations was because that presumption was believed to exist, that if you had automobile insurance, the presumption would be that you would drive more reckless. Now, that, of course, is not true, and that's that's since been rejected, but your point's the same. Well, and to my point, and to to uh, Council Member Hewitt, just, you know, especially our volunteer boards and positions and, you know, let's say our, somebody on DRB or BZA or Planning Commission, you know, had a position and made a decision and you had somebody just wasn't happy about it and, you know, threw up a complaint and they ended up having to spend thousands of dollars. That's a very good incentive for them not to run or, or uh, you know, want to donate their time or their right. efforts to the city. So, again, that's, uh, that's a good point. Anybody else? Okay. Um, let's move on to our next hearing, public hearing, City. Next item is consideration of a resolution of the City of Milton, Georgia, extending until March 7th, 2017. 
an existing moratorium barring the acceptance of applications for conceptual plan approval for subdivisions located within the five acre road zone. Agenda item number 16271, Mr. Ken Gerard. Mr. Mayor, Member of Council, this is a public hearing with respect to a moratorium that is actually, actually forms a part of the moratorium uh, public hearing that's actually next in your agenda as well. You may recall that the council previously approved the uh, moratorium uh, barring the acceptance of applications for conceptual plans for subdivisions on property adjacent to Highway 9. Uh, between the Forsyth County line and the city limits of the city of Alpharetta, but we excluded the five-acre <coughs> area road zone. This was the moratorium to include that area back in the moratorium. This moratorium expires on its terms on December 6th. The public hearing this evening is to go ahead and get in front of that one before it expires and move it out to March 7th. And just to let you know, the next public hearing we have right after this one is to take the remainder of that moratorium and move it out to March 7th as well. So all, both moratoriums, which work sort of hand in glove, both expire on March 7th. So that is the purpose of this. Question, do they have to be tied together? Or they do, because it, you know, we, we adopted the first one, which included the totality of the Highway 9 area, but left out five acre. Then, of course, it was brought. We needed to include that in. So we're basically just pushing these down the line now together uh, to form a seamless whole. That's why we're doing this. So to answer my question, the decision needs to, whatever the decision is, it goes with both. It's correct. Not, That's correct. Yes. Okay. Do we have any public comment? We do not, sir. Okay. I'll close the public hearing then. Um, any council questions on this? Okay. Move on to our final public hearing. City, if you'll call this item. Consideration of a resolution of the City of Milton, Georgia, extending until March 7, 2017, an existing moratorium barring the acceptance of applications for conceptual plan approval for subdivisions on property adjacent to Highway 9 between the Forsyth County line and the city limits of the City of Alpharetta, excluding property located in the five-acre road zone, agenda item number 16272, Mr. Ken Gerard. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, thank you. Uh, same comments. This is the remainder of the uh, Highway 9 corridor we're attempting to protect. And uh, if you adopt this when it comes up on the later part of your agenda, it will move this moratorium into March. Do we have any public comment, City? We do not, sir. Okay. I'll close the hearing. <coughs> any questions for Ken or staff on this? Rick? Just one question. I know when we put these moratoriums in place, we were talking about amending the the code that that basically affects along Highway Nine, what gets yes. built. Can you tell me where we stand on trying to do those amendments, the text amendments? Planning Commission um, at their meeting this month that was held last week um, did review these uh, proposed text amendments as it relates to five acres and then the, the entire corridor as well. And so so they did um, vote on it. And um, so therefore, you will be seeing it next month for okay. first read and then second read. Okay, so this just then covers us till we can actually review that and, and hear it in December. That is correct, sir. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. So if we can move on to our zoning agenda, you will please read the rules and then sound the items. At the second regularly scheduled meeting of the month, the mayor and city council consider a zoning agenda. These items include rezoning petitions, modifications of zoning, use permits, and associated concurrent variances, in addition to ordinances, resolutions, and text amendments. I would like to acquaint you with some of the rules and procedures for this meeting. The applicant and all those speaking in support of an application will be allowed a total of 10 minutes to present the petition. The applicant may choose to save some of the time for rebuttal following the presentation by the opposition. Since the burden of proof is upon the applicant, the applicant will be allowed to make closing remarks provided time remains with the allotted time. Those called to speak will be taken in the order that the speaker cards are received by the city clerk prior to the beginning of tonight's meeting. If you are speaking on behalf of a group or organization, 
An affidavit must accompany your public comment card. Before beginning your presentation or comment, please identify yourself by name, address, and organization if applicable. Our first zoning item this evening is consideration of RZ 16-04 to create retaining wall standards in Chapter 64, Article 17, Division 3, Site Improvement Standards, Agenda Item Number 16256. First presentation was at the November 7th regular city council meeting. This was discussed at the November 14th council work session. Ms. Kathy Field. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the city council. Um, staff believes that there is a need to provide additional regulations on retaining walls that may impact surrounding buildings, land, and uses, and also to require the construction of retaining walls in a manner consistent with engineering and construction best practices. And lastly, to lessen the impact of large retaining walls on abutting properties and the public by encouraging the use of landscaping and aesthetically pleasing design elements. The proposed amendments were discussed at the work session last week, and it should be noted that the, attached, that the proposed regulations will apply to all retaining walls except those walls measuring a height of less than four feet as well as um, a terrace combination of walls in which each separate wall retains less than four feet of unbalanced fill and each successive wall is separated by a distance of at least one times the height of the highest wall. Um, both Carter and I are available to answer any questions you may have on these, <coughs> this proposed amendment. Okay. Do we have any public comment on? We do not, sir. Okay. We don't have any public support or opposition, so. None, sir. So, all right, I'll close the public hearing and then open up for questions. Staff. Anybody have any questions? Bill? <coughs> Excuse me for not uh, <coughs> reviewing this, but uh, reviewing it more than what I had. But these uh, walls uh, four feet and higher do have to be uh, designed by a registered engineer, is that correct? Uh, but <coughs> only above six feet. So between four and six, they would require a permit, but they would not uh, be an engineered type wall. Is there any restriction on the type of uh, materials used on walls between four and six feet? Um, so no timber walls? Right. Um, modular block walls, so we've given a, um, a three-piece type modular block wall as opposed to the uniform block to just to give a little bit of um, texture. And then uh, the poured concrete walls would be clad in brick or stone. Okay. okay. To that point, <coughs> um, a lot of jurisdictions um, try to do, you know, anything that's required with a permit, you know, above that four feet would require to be designed and, and by a professional engineer. Do you? Mm -hmm. I would kind of like to see that maybe thought about it, unless you have a reason. A six foot wall is a pretty tall wall. It is a tall it's wall, gonna, gonna right? A lot back, but some, what, what are we reviewing the permit? You know, what's the permit? What are we reviewing against? Just looking Ma at it and materials, location, um, so aesthetics versus a aesthetics. That's right. So it's just the balance between the threshold of what do we require the homeowner to do to get a permit versus a full engineered set of drawings on those types of walls. Um, you're right, various jurisdictions will go down to four feet. Um, Fulton County, I believe, is the same four feet uh, for a permit, six feet for engineered drawings. Um, so it's just it's just a balance. I mean, we could we could pick just, another. I would just think, in my opinion, that if somebody's a homeowner, you know, say a, 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 a regrade of their backyard, if, if they're needing to put a four-foot wall up, it's, it's a pretty big project. Um, so I'd like to maybe see us consider requiring an engineer design for whatever we require a permit for. We could certainly also look at uh, just standard design details between four and six. That would give them an opportunity to construct the wall to uh, what we would consider to be an approved standard and then engineer drawings um, uh, beyond six if that's something you would like to consider too. Yeah, I think Councilman Hewitt brings up a good point. 
but also you do get to, um, you know, and I know different jurisdictions have different thresholds, but I, I kind of like that it kind of hits the middle to where, you know, you've got some standards that you follow, engineering guidelines, um, and people know what to expect with it between four and six, but don't have to go to the expense of a full structural engineer, but obviously you get on up to the part said six foot wall, you know, could really hold some, hold some uh, earth back. So, um, you know, having the structural engineer on that kind of makes us we, good. We, we wouldn't have, if we, if we did something with a, in between four to six more than we, more than stated, would, would us permitting, and I, I think I know the answer to this, but if there is, does that give us any liability if it fails? I don't think so. So I can tell you what Alpharetta does. Um, they do that from the perspective of a four-foot high wall requires a permit to which you can either have a professionally designed wall or you can build it to the city standards. Okay. I would support that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, having a standard, we wouldn't be surprised in that. So I guess that begs the question, do we have a city standard? I don't. Not yet. <laughs> we will. But we can. Uh, <laughs> I believe uh, Forsyth County's threshold is five feet. Anything five feet and over uh, must be designed by an engineer. Could be. I pulled Alpharetta, Fulton County, and uh, Sandy Springs just for reference. How, how tough? San, Sandy Springs is six. You know, how tough would that be to come up with a standard, city standard? Not tough. I mean, we were basically in between the interim used uh, Georgia DOT standard details. So. Okay. Yeah. All right. I would support doing something there in between the four and six for the city standard. Um, and, um, put it on there. Any other questions? Let's see, I believe I, I had closed the um, hearing, so I think we're up to. Do we have a motion on this item? I'll make a motion if somebody in front of me knows what we want to, knows how to capture that four to six foot language. Probably somewhere between Ken and Carter. It must it be Steve. The other way mm -hmm. yeah. um, Steve so well, I'm, sure. I'm, I'm reading my notes here. Uh, I think it's as simply as um, the four foot wall must be professionally engineered or built to city standards. Four to six feet. Four to six feet, that's correct. And above six, six feet and above would require professionally engineered drawings. So basically, Six feet above professional engineered drawings, four feet above and above would be professional engineered or um, city standard. Correct. Between four and six, right? Between yeah, let's make sure it says six, between four and six, six though. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to make a motion to approve agenda item 16256 with the uh, addition or alteration that um, walls above six feet will be um, designed by professional engineer and walls four to six feet will either be designed by a professional engineer or meet the city standards that uh, we're going to create. Second that motion. Okay, <clears throat> motion from Councilmember Hewitt as read and captured by our staff. A second from Councilmember Lusk. Any discussion? All in favor? Please say aye. 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 Any opposed? So that passes unanimous, Sudi. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to our uh, final zoning agenda item. Sudi, if you'll please sound that item. The next item is consideration of RZ 1606 to require fence permits for fences erected for agricultural purposes in section 64212, fence and wall specifications exemptions. Agenda item number 16257. First presentation was at the November 7th City Council meeting and was discussed at the November 14th Council work session. Ms. Kathy Field. Thank you, um, Mr. Mayor. Um, currently, fence permits for fences erected for agricultural purposes, such as enclosing animals or crops, um, are not required. Over the past few months, there have been fences erected in the city that do not meet the requirements for agricultural fencing. Therefore, it is staff's opinion that by requiring a fence permit to review the construction of the fence, compliance can be maintained throughout the city. In addition, however, staff has proposed that a permit fee will not be required for this type of permit. This item was d discussed um, at the work session, and I'm certainly available for any questions you may have. Well, you know, one thing I want to bring up, since we have uh, 
to our talk in agricultural fences, and we um, are setting up a equestrian committee. Um, is that something we could could uh, have those folks take a look at? Um, you know, possibly defer this and have them take a look at this to get some feedback from. You know, again, we want to support our equestrian and landowners, but they're only a small percentage of the actual population, so it'd be great to have have uh, give some time to get their feedback. I certainly, we'd be totally understand to where staff's it. coming on it makes yes. makes sense, but I'd also like to thoroughly vet it that way if that's possible. But I'll open up questions. So let me ask: Do you have any public comment, City? We do not, sir. Okay, we'll close the public hearing and open up questions. Council. Bill? Um, I think that's a great uh, suggestion to defer it uh, for review by that committee. I guess the question comes up, uh, what's the what's the status of the formation of that committee? <laughs> that's exactly the question <laughs> I was going to ask. <laughs> well, you could go ahead and ask. Um, yeah, we just discussed it, yeah. So. Are we, have we solicited uh, uh, nominations. And that would be and we passed update. an ordinance. We talked we about it. And Courtney's drawing this up right now after after our last meeting. Um, yeah. Yeah. She, yeah. They're working on with Ken putting the uh, putting the resolution together, and uh, we should be moving shortly. Yeah, council agreed to move okay. forward with it. So it would be up to council to nominate folks on it. So, but as, as Steve said, it's being being written up now. I guess the point of the question then. If we're going to defer it, uh, need to have some idea of the length of time required. Is it going to be 90 days or 120 days? Or? I don't think it hurts to go ahead and pass this change as it is and then have the um, equestrian committee work on maybe some city standards and stuff for equestrian or agricultural fences. But I, I don't think it hurts to go ahead and make, require a fence permit since there's no fee for any fences even for agricultural for now. You know, I sort of disagree. I'd rather either defer it or deny it and start over um, with, the, with the equestrian councils. Rick? And one of the concerns when that was brought up at the work session was the timing and the turnaround of fences because if someone needs it for agricultural purposes, you can't, how quickly are we going to respond? If someone sees a need and says, hey, I need to erect a fence, because my animal is going to get out. That was brought before us last time, so I think we need to, what's the sense of urgency and are we going to put some time time gaps on there so we hold ourselves to the standard? Um, well, our, our process is really is just to review what the fence looks like, the height of it, its location, and that can be done really very quickly. It's just a matter of um, working with the homeowner to in, indeed make sure that uh, what what the homeowner landowner is proposing is something that's consistent with our, our rules. Yeah, I guess I'd, I'm okay with doing a deferral, um, but I would also ask that when we bring if we bring this before the equestrian community, we also get their input on what they'd like to see as far as turnaround, because they're the ones that are going to be, or anybody with agricultural <coughs> use, those are the residents that are going to be impacted by the new process. Sure. Anybody else? Just keep in, keep in mind, Council, there would be nothing to prevent. You, if you wanted to move forward on this this evening, you may not. You know, I think that's probably where it's heading. But if you did, there would be nothing to prevent this committee, once it's formed, to take the lid off your ordinances and look at a lot of the uh, provisions dealing with the equestrian community and therefore make recommendations on changing anything, even if you had adopted it this evening. So just, just bear, bear that in mind. It doesn't mean it's final. Okay. Anybody else? All right, I'll open up for a motion. You want to make a motion? I'll make a motion. Bill? Uh, Mayor, I'll move, uh, make a motion to defer RZ1606 to require fence permits for fences erected for agricultural purposes in section 64-212, fence and wall specifications exemptions uh, for 90 days or until uh, formation, creation of the equestrian uh, council and uh, pending their recommendations to uh, perfect 
the subordinates. Okay, do I have a second? I have a motion second. for deferral. I have a motion for deferral 90 days or until the question committee is, is formed and in function. Councilmember Lost, second by Councilmember Morey. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That's, you, that's unanimous, city. Okay, if we can move on to unfinished business. City, if you'd please sound the item. Consideration of an ordinance to amend Chapter 2, Article 8, Ethics Code of the City of Milton Code of Ordinances, Agenda item number 16245. This was discussed under new business at the October 17th meeting. The public hearing was held this evening. Mr. Ken Gerard. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, this is the ordinance that we had previously discussed at the public hearing just a few minutes before. Um, so unless the council has any further questions for me, there is an ordinance in your book. Yes, sir. Okay, Jeff. So Ken, I just want to be real clear. This, the voting on this particular item has nothing to do with the fact that the city provides coverage for all of its employees and, and the council members in terms of liability. So, so if we were to get sued for something and, and, you know, something bad happened, we still have liability insurance. This is really covering expense, out-of-pocket expenses to have representation for things that are related to ethical complaints. Th that's correct, Councilmember Longoria. The, the, the city has, you know, excellent sh insurance through, I think it's IRMA, and uh, that, that applies irrespective of what you do with respect to this very narrow accommodation for ethics complaints. Would the insurance cover attorney's fees um, for someone acting within the, within the scope of their employment? Well, to the extent it's based upon monetary liability, but they would not cover this. Because this isn't this so isn't a, a this isn't a monetary yeah. claim. This is an ethical conduct claim. Your ARMA insurance policy is is structured to cover monetary claims, claims seeking monetary damages. And just to clear up one other misconception on on this, um, I, I also attended the uh, the hearing. The while the hearing ended exactly the way it, it should have after 20 minutes. Um, what you, what you're probably uh, uh, maybe missing is the fact that that's not where it begins. Um, the respondents required to provide a written response prior to that meeting submitted to the panel and they're to review that. Um, so there is a significant amount of, of work that goes in prior that prior to that that first initial convening of the panel. Yeah, I guess my point is that you know, in, in two weeks' time, we're going to celebrate our 10-year anniversary. We haven't had this coverage ever. Correct. Okay? That's correct. And it doesn't seem to have been a big deal, or at least nobody's mentioned the fact that it is a big deal. Now, I don't want to say past circumstances, you know, predict uh, anything for the future, but I guess my point is, and, and getting to maybe the citizens' sensitivity, sensitivity to this, is if it's... If it hasn't been an issue, why all of a sudden is it an issue? Why do we have to take action on this? I just wanted to be sure that the underlying issue of a monetary um, uh, lawsuit or whatever we want to call it, complaint, is already covered under the current uh, instruments that we have in place. It is. Okay. You know, I just, but to clarify, I, I didn't have anything to do with this being brought up. I probably got spurred, you know, when there's... Um, ethics charges coming up and you know and Kenneth just to make sure I've had a ethics complaint filed against myself in the past so we'll make sure there's not a conflict of interest yeah. in, in talking about this yeah. or moving forward and, yeah. I, and I'll use that as an example yeah. um, you know what, 10 years ago or not quite 10 years ago you know I got a frivolous uh, complaint against me which absolutely made no sense I wrote a letter in the duty in my job description but anyways long story short you know, I had to answer, I, and I hired an attorney, and it cost me about $2,500 out of pocket myself. And, you know, again, it, it got dropped and whatnot. But now, granted, you know, as much money as I make being the mayor, $2,500 was nothing, but <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> but, uh, you know, moving forward, Joe, I, I mean, you know, whether the mayor or council or folks on the board and all that, somebody that's qualified may sit there and, you know, 
they may not remember that or someone may mention it or they may ask me about it or whatever and they may sit there and think, you know, and this may be the best person that would serve the city, the absolute, you know, best candidate out there. And they say, you know, I'm not going to put myself through that. I'd at least like to know I have a little bit of coverage if it's, if it's bogus. Yeah. And again, I think that's the key. Number one, I think we need to make sure that any citizen that brings forward an ethics charge is feels totally comfortable and is handled professionally and moved forward so that they don't have to feel like they have to have a lawyer or that's necessary or whatever. Um, and number two, this is only to prevent, you know, uh, monetary loss if it's totally bogus, if it's somebody that's just out there trying to stir something up. If absolutely, if there's anything unethical, then this is not, you know, and it, it, it is proven, it's not going to, it's not going to cover it, correct? Right. So I'm trying to, Make sure we all understand, and more importantly, the public understands what a, what this action really means. So, in the past, let's go five years. How many ethics complaints have been raised against city employees or, or elected officials? Do we have any idea about that? I'm aware of. I'm aware of. In the past five years, one, maybe two. Okay. So this is I don't, again. Past performance doesn't predict future results, but this is not something we deal with on a regular basis. That's correct. But I, I can help you with that. I put this before you. Um, and the reason I did is because in the short time I've been in this position, there have been one that went through and another one that was being threatened. Um, and they're not only against the seven council members. It's uh, you have a lot of volunteer members that you appoint to other boards. And um, I believe, or and I think that most of you believe that it's important to protect those people in some manner. And uh, all you would really need is one unprotected volunteer member to be subjected to something like this, and uh, the results could be uh, could be fairly negative. Good, Joe. Yeah, and I'm sorry to keep asking questions. On Please, can mm -hmm. if let's pretend like we did we didn't take this action. Okay sometime in the future, a complaint gets made and the complaint turns into something that is really difficult and it does require attorneys and there is some real expense that's racked up. Let's say it's under the $5,000 limit that we're thinking about tonight. Is there anything that the council can do to take action or the city manager for that matter if it's a city employee to help the employee or the council member out at that point in time and make this a one off as opposed to a policy decision. Uh, my tip, hearing that fresh right now, that question, my typical response to that would be uh, no, that that would need to be made a policy before the event okay. occurs right. as Thank opposed you. to later. <laughs> if yeah, I can clarify one, uh, forgive me, Mr. Oh, no. I, just no, want, go ahead. I just wanted to clarify one thing just because I want to be very clear. Th this does not require, this reimbursement does not require a finding of frivolity or it is a ridiculous, I mean, this is right. layman's term, a right. ridiculous complaint. This requires that the city official or the employee prevail. prevail. Right. Okay. Not guilty, so to speak. Okay. There actually is a frivolity section. There's a wrongful use section that deals with true abuses of the ethics ordinance that is different. This simply requires that the city official or employee win. Right. And, and to Joe's point, you know, this is one of those you hope you never use. Right. right. Like the pilots, you know, 90% of what they train for, they hope they never use them. Right. You know, again, we hope this would, would never, never happen. But to your point, it's almost like we go back to the car insurance. You can't go get insurance once it's happened. Right. If we waited until this was up, I don't think we could necessarily put in place something to cover right. it. So, right. you know, the biggest, the biggest thing is, again, I, I think we may be making too much out of this and spending too much time. It's, you know, it's a, a you know, standard thing that, you want to provide some co some coverage for anybody that's willing to step up or employee in the in their duties as as they're elected to do or or, or hired to do. Um, we hope we never use it. Um, you know, in the past, it's it's you know, we, as you say, in five years, it's a couple of times possibly. Um, but anyway, that's kind of my my position on it. Bill, you care? Yeah, I'll uh, reflect on the mayor's experience. I had a similar one at the, uh, during the same time period, and there seemed to be a flurry of those, and uh, they were frivolous. Uh, they were proven frivolous. Uh, in my case, uh, it was dismissed by the Ethics Commission, 
and the complainant uh, appealed it to the State Ethics Board. And you talk about a summary judgment. Uh, when my case came up, it was summarily uh, dismissed within about two minutes. Uh, so there are people out there who consider it sport to file claims like that. And I think what uh, this uh, modification of the ordinance uh, addresses is to uh, minimize or discourage something that's uh, frivolous, it's time consuming, it's, it's a waste of time as some people uh, refer to, and it's, uh, in my case, mine went on for three months before it was even heard before the Ethics Commission. Uh, the case that happened here a couple weeks ago that was uh, uh, heard by the panel, uh, just to repeat what the city manager said, uh, it was not a summar summary judgment uh, decided within 20 minutes. Uh, the panel uh, has access to the records, to the claims, and uh, they do review them before they come uh, forth in a panel uh, situation. Uh, If, uh, if this weren't in place, and I, I, I suspect that we'd probably some, see some of these come forth uh, in the near future, uh, I think this would tend to discourage that and hopefully, uh, hopefully keep people civil out here and uh, discourage them from using this ordinance in a, a frivolous, mean-spirited way. Karen? I was just going to say, uh, having this ordinance in place probably means we'll never have to use it. And if we didn't have it in place, we'd probably have to use it. So mm -hmm. I'll just say, go ahead and get it in place. And that, and that doesn't force somebody to, just like any expensive reports, some of us have turned in them, some of us haven't. You don't necessarily have to turn in your, if you don't. You know, right. It's an option, it. not a requirement. Well, gotcha. yeah, but one, one point right here, I want to make sure that we're very clear and transparent. This is certainly not intended to not use it, not use the, you know, if someone has an ethics or a thought of an ethics violation, they certainly, this, this shouldn't be any kind of deterrent. That's no, that's no. I mean, I have, I, have seen, I have seen ethics ordinances that have tried to be amended where the government goes after the complaining party and things of that nature, um, and that's not what this is. This yeah, is, yeah, this is to protect this is not what that is. an innocent person. If, if they're innocent, it's not to make it harder on the, on the uh, complaint. That's so. not the intent of it. Rick? And again, it's not upfront fronting of money. You have to go through the process. And then what, what I read in there is also you, the city attorney, would review any submitted expenses for reimbursement, make sure that they're not excessive and they're reasonable and that's true. Uh, that is exactly right. And I will also tell you, having some experience with this statute, that, that if it is one of you that is, the, that is the individual requesting your own attorney's fees be reviewed by me, I typically ask for a concurring opinion by an outside attorney simply because I'm otherwise signing off on you getting paid. Right. And okay. so I typically will ask for another attorney to review my work as well. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? If not, I'll open up for a motion. Anybody want to make a motion? Yeah, Mayor, I move that uh, we approve uh, a considerate, uh, we approve an ordinance to amend Chapter 2, Article 8, Ethics Code of the City of Milton, Code of Ordinances, Agenda Item Number 16-245. The thing that I would say in terms of why I would support this is that um, we need to take down barriers related to people volunteering for the city and people running for office. We don't have enough of either one, and so if this is something that can help uh, take care of that, then I'm all for it. Second. All right. We have a motion for approval from Councilmember Longoria. Second from Councilmember Hewitt. Um, and I, I just, you know, again, want to echo those comments. It's, you know, to me, it's, it's not necessarily about myself or even so much the, the council. It's, it's more for the, you know, other volunteers too that, um, you know, there's lots and lots of volunteers. We've got hundreds of volunteers and uh, working for the city, so we want to protect them. So, okay, good. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That's unanimous, city.
Continue with our new business item, City. Please sound the item. I believe we're at uh, item number 16-244. Consideration of an ordinance to amend the charter of the City of Milton for the purpose of clarifying section 1.12B40A and section 6.11B. This is agenda item number 16-244. This was discussed under new business at the October 17th regular city council meeting. Mr. Ken Gerard. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, thank you very much. This is a first presentation to you other than in a work session of a proposed modification to the city of Milton Charter. As the council is aware, under Georgia law, both municipalities and counties have home rule, which means we have the ability, among other things, to modify our own charter if certain protocols are followed. In this situation, one of those protocols is is it has to be a subject matter which we are empowered with home rule to modify. We have to run a legal ad in the paper, uh, which we have done advertising this home rule modification. We ran that uh, legal ad on November 17th. We will run it again on November 21st and November 28th. Um, and then we have to actually adopt the ordinance twice. Uh, one of those is going to be this evening uh, if the council sees fit, and the other one is proposed to be on December 5th. You have to adopt it two times. Once you've adopted it twice, then we get it down to the Secretary of State, and it becomes part of your law. This is a home rule modification that is attempted to clean up uh, what we believe the General Assembly was attempting to do in your charter with respect to your ad valorem property tax caps. In section 1.112, they did in fact provide that your tax cap of 4.731 mills uh, only had application to your operating budget because we wanted to make clear it did not apply to your general obligation bond ability, which is where you pledge your full faith and credit uh, to impose um, taxes to pay back bonded indebtedness, not unlike the bonded indebtedness that was just approved uh, by the, the uh, people and taxpayers of Milton. So in section 1.12B40A in your agenda book, I hope you can see that on page two of your packet, you will see some bold language and it says parenthetical, not general obligation bond purposes. Again, attempting to make sure that it is very clear, which is what we believe the General Assembly was attempting to do, that your uh, debt, uh, your ad valorem tax limitations don't apply to your GO bond debt repayment obligation. Then in section 6.11b, they omitted it altogether uh, out of that language, and it was supposed to have been included there. So there, in that section of the Milton Charter, it needs to provide uh, for operating budget purposes, parent, not general obligation bond purposes. Again, the objective is simply to make clear that the cap on your ability to impose ad valorem property taxes does not apply to GO bond debt repayment. Mr. Mayor, again, there's no public hearing. There could be public comment, of course, but there's no public hearing on this. The primary uh, requisite to being able to modify the charter this way is to have uh, two readings of it, one tonight, one on December 5th, and you do have to adopt the ordinance both times. Mr. Mayor. Okay, so we don't make a decision on this. You'll, you'll need to adopt we'll it this evening. Yeah. adopt it tonight. Two times, okay. Right, Bill. Uh, Ken. <coughs> Since the uh, green space bond was approved uh, a couple of weeks ago, yes, and uh, we're just bringing forth this uh, modification here, is there any possibility we get a legal challenge that uh, this didn't apply back on the 8th of November? No. I I'm very comfortable with that. I I'm comfortable that we have every right under Georgia law to go out for geo bonded indebtedness. But as we go forward, uh, go forward to actually having the debt drawn down and the underwriting, this is mainly a product of the underwriters because the underwriters who basically assessed how good our credit worthiness is, that's who this is really for. They want to make sure that our ability to assess taxes is not limited by that millage cap. Right. And we do only receive permission from the citizens to do this. We haven't actually taken any action. That's correct. Right. But, it, but to Councilmember Love's point, um, it, it would be it would be easy to, 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 to construe it that way, but the geo bond debt was simply, as Councilman Longoria said, that's the permission. Now we've got to go forward and actually do it, and that's why this needs to be done now. Got it. Thank you. Take care. I'm really comfortable with the fact that this was the intent, especially where it says under 6.11 that the ad valorem taxes on real property 
uh, shall not exceed 4.731 unless a higher millage rate is recommended by resolution of the city council and subsequently approved by a majority of the qualified voters of the city voting in a referendum. Which that's they just That's exactly did. what happened. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Now, you all followed the law exactly, which is in Georgia to incur most debt. Citizens have to approve it, and they did. Okay. Anybody else? <coughs> Okay, I'll open up for a motion. Mayor, I'll move to take a motion that we approve agenda item number 16-244. Second. Okay, I have a motion by Council Member Thurman, second by Council Member Lusk. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? It passes unanimous. City, if you'll please call the next item. Next item is consideration of a resolution of the City of Milton, Georgia extending until March 7th, 2017, an existing moratorium barring the acceptance of applications for conceptual plan approval for subdivisions located within the five-acre road zone. This is agenda, agenda item number 16271. Public hearing was held this evening. Mr. Ken Gerard. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, this is the resolution extending the moratorium until March 7th, 2017 for the five acre road zone. There is a resolution in your agenda packet if the council sees fit to extend the moratorium. I would simply make sure that you include in your motion that you're approving the resolution in your packet. Okay, and just to clarify, um, Ken, this, this item goes alongside with the, with the next item. Next as far next as if item. you decided one thing on this one, you couldn't do. Okay. All right, any questions? We've talked about this. Um, all right, so we don't need to take a vote on it now, is that correct? Mr. Mayor, yeah, this one does require a vote, and just all I'm asking is just to approve the resolution in your agenda book. Okay, I'll uh, mm -hmm. open up for a motion. I'll make a motion to approve agenda item 16271 with the, uh, uh, that includes the um, resolution. resolution in the agenda packet. Second. I have a motion for approval. Councilmember Hewitt, second by Councilmember Morick. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimous, City. And City, if you'll please sound the next business item. Next item is consideration of a resolution of the City of Milton, Georgia, extending until March 7, 2017, an existing moratorium, barring the acceptance of applications for conceptual plan approval for subdivisions on property adjacent to Highway 9 between the Forsyth County line and the city limits of the city of Alpharetta, excluding property located in the five-acre road zone. Public hearing was held this evening. Mr. Ken Gerard. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, this is the other shoe to drop. This is the remainder of the moratorium with respect to Highway 9. And as before, I would request uh, this be approved, particularly since you've approved the first one and please make reference to the resolution in your packet. Okay, any questions? If not, I'll open up for a motion. Mr. Mayor, I'd make a motion that we approve agenda item number 16-272 as per the resolution in our packet. Second. I have a motion from Council Member Morick and a second from Council Member Thurman. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That's unanimous. Okay, City, we'll move on, and if you'll please call the next new business item. Next item is consideration of a resolution to approve Mobility LLC's application for utilization of the public rights of way of the City of Milton for telecommunication facilities as authorized by law. Agenda item number 16, 275. This was discussed at the November 14th work session. Mr. Ken Gerard. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, you have in front of you a resolution approving mobility's application for utilization of the public right-of-way pursuant to Georgia law. We discussed this in some detail at the work session. I think the council made some good points with respect to some of the reservations about this. We put up on the screen some examples of what we're calling the small cell technology. State law is simply a manifestation of the public policy in Georgia that they want to encourage the ability of these sorts of providers to be able to locate within Georgia generally. Uh, and upon our receipt of a completed application, we have 60 days to approve uh, their, their um, request. If we do not, on the 61st day, it's deemed approved anyway. 
So with respect to this small cell technology application <coughs> by, by mobility, here is what I think the chronology of events will be. I do recommend that you approve this resolution this evening, authorizing the fact that their application <coughs> is complete. They are a provider that is entitled to use the city's right of way. The next step will be they will have to tender to us a telecommunications ordinance application where we're going to be able to apply some of our rules and regulations to what they put in our right of way. I have also seen Mr. Lucas was kind enough to forward to me a small cell uh, specific ordinance and I got to tell you based upon my belief that this is the wave of the future with respect to the sorts of technology applications we're going to be getting that candidly we ought to get this on a work session very quickly, this small cell ordinance that I think is what duplicative of what Roswell may have done, Carter. And I think we need to take a look at this in earnest uh, because I think that this is not going to slow down and I think we need to take be good stewards of our right-of-way. So while they have the ability to put these structures in our right-of-way, we have the ability to reasonably regulate it. And so this is just a first step, but there's going to be more of this. And, and just to clarify, this, this is basically just allowing them which they have the legal rights to, to use our, our right-of-way. Um, but to be clear to the public that as these are brought forward, they'll have to be vetted through public and meet our standards and whatnot. We'll have to work on our ordinance. And I, Mr. Mayor, you're correct, but I think right now, I think the law and the practicality of the law are having to catch up with one another right now because I do think that there is an interest in advancing these sorts of technology solutions throughout Georgia. But on the other hand, our citizens have an interest in ensuring that their right-of-ways um, are not encumbered you know, in a very aesthetically ug ugly way. Yeah, and that's, that's my point. I want to make sure that trying to be as candid as I can be. We have have a opportunity to and, and, know, yeah, discuss and, I and look at and make hopefully make you know changes and tweaks in this or have have some some influence. Well, on we've it. got some long, issues with mobility with right now. We sent them an email today <laughs> asking for a meeting candidly with city staff in my office because some of their application is a little confusing to me. Uh, I'm not sure whether they truly are a fiber optic solution or not. In their application, I think they indicate that they're not, and then another place they indicate that they are. So we have got some fairly strong questions to ask them of what they intend to do, what is their expectation long term, is this a spec poll, do they have actual um, entities that want to locate on this, what is their position going to be on the co-location. There's just a lot of questions that we need to get to the bottom of. But unfortunately, the law is right now that with respect to this resolution, taking no action is not really an option. If we take no action, then it's nonetheless going to be deemed to be approved. So what recourse does the city have then once we do approve this and we bring them in to uh, resolve all these unanswered questions? and, and it's a good if question. If that That's happens, what, you, know. you know, suppose we do object to them, what, what is our position at that time? I don't know that we're going to be in a position to absolutely say no. I think the next, the, sort of my vision for the next step is going to be, first of all, have this, them in, figure out what their objective is in the city of Milton, what is the service they're attempting to provide, and what I mean by that is, is do they actually have users that are attempting to locate on this right. poll? I want to make sure that our rules and regulations are tight enough that we're not allowing overlap uh, with respect to propagation uh, of, of the various signals. And, and I think at the end of the day, Councilmember Laws, what I'll be looking for is some sort of a memorandum of understanding or an agreement that we will have a meeting of the minds with them as to what the future may hold with respect to the number and the potential locations. Okay. Do we know at this time, based on the law, is there any limitation on <laughs> the numbers of them in the right of way? Not that I'm aware of right now. Okay. Not that I, as you've you've asked that question before, and it continues to be a good question, um, but I'm not aware of any limitation um, f from a legal standpoint. But I but I do believe from a practical standpoint and a technology standpoint, and ca and candidly even a public safety standpoint, there is going to be a limit. But that's where I think we need to really get on a fast track with the small small cell technology ordinance and go ahead and lock that in from a true regulatory standpoint. Mm -hmm. Do we uh, know uh, how this is uh, matriculated through other jurisdictions around here I do and not. what their comments have been? It's a great question and I can't answer that yet. It won't be long till I can, but I can't answer I'm it yet. Sure. 
not that I'm trying to discourage this technology. No. I think it's great. I understand. Obviously, you know, questions abound. They're a lot better than the than the traditional cell towers that we all think of when we think of cell towers. And in fact, it was, it was interesting. I, on, on Sunday, I saw. Now that you're sensitized, now that I'm sensitized to it, I saw some in another jurisdiction, and they and they aren't as as offensive. I mean, they look like utility poles. However, you know the devil's in the details. Sure. Just very tall, tall utility poles. They are taller than a wooden power line. So, so speaking to the aesthetics and what we could do as far as requiring what's around it or what we, as of today, because their application came in before we have a formal ordinance for this type of thing, we can negotiate with them, but that's what we're trying to work towards is getting a set, set of standards, looking to the future to protect us to say, if you put this pole, you know, you want to put it within our right of way, here's what we're expecting as far as how you're going to, what it's going to look like, what you're going to do as far as down at the lower area, you know, that type of thing. You know, right now we have a telecommunications ordinance, and I think that would be applicable. We have taken the position that that's the, that's the ordinance, that's the regulatory guidelines they're going to have to comply with. But I think Carter's point is a good one, that really it is not specifically tailored to this sort of technology, right. and we need something exacting toward this sort of technology as opposed to the more omnibus telecommunication. Okay. Uh, gentleman, Karen. So, Steve, you this technology, I mean, while it's new to us, isn't new. I mean, they've been working on this stuff for the past five years. Not only have they been working on it, they've been probably in navigating the legal waters mm -hmm. to use this in other jurisdictions right away. How does a city like Milton, who doesn't have an unlimited number of resources, keep tabs on what kind of technology issues or challenges we need to be looking at so that we can't get caught with you know, oh, somebody's making an application for something we have no rules or regulations on. How, how do we get a, How do we get in front of that? I think we need to be more aware of our environment. Um, this just ha we just happened to have had a, uh, a recent meeting with a with another company that is going to be just behind this one, um, looking to install similar type uh, uh, of equipment, because from the way it was described to me, and and I'm certainly not a, a technological genius. Um, this is the wave that's going to be bringing us into the 5G speeds. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and this is how they're going to start moving the, uh, the data. It's incumbent upon us as a municipality, as staff, um, to get it, continue the meetings, get ahead of the trends, figure out um, what it is we need to do to make sure we can have whatever control we can have, which is fairly minimal in this situation, over what the end product is. Um, the way it was described to me is if some of these places, uh, if you're not if you're not integral to whatever network they're creating, if you're not in whatever, some grid that they need, they'll just bypass you. Um, and they're like, fine, you don't want the technology, you don't have to have it, but with that in 10 years, you also won't have uh, the same investment. You'll have been left behind in the technological infrastructure. Well, technologists always love to use that as the threat, and, and, and sometimes it comes true, sometimes it doesn't. I guess my point is, there's got to be some GMA working group that, you know, deals with this kind of stuff and can at least be our, you know, canary in the coal mines. It so exists, Carter. Carter and I just talked about this, Carter. Uh, and I don't. Want, I want to add just one thing. It's not that we didn't have any regulations to govern this. It's that we right. believe that the regulations we have in place need to be a little bit more specific. As we've looked at other small cell technologies that came in previously, they were to be located on existing poles and they were going to be regular telephone pole size. So this is the first one that we've seen. It's been 78, 79 feet tall. Um, and I don't know if, you know, the jurisdictions that I deal with, I don't know that they've seen any of that tall too. So the uh, regulations are more to tailor it specifically to this type of technology and to govern it back to what we have seen previously submitted on this type okay. of technology. Okay, Karen? Just to make sure I understand this, we're not giving them blanket approval to do whatever they want. Basically, we're saying we're giving approval and we're going to work out the details of this approval going forward. That's right, Councilmember Thurman. This is the first step. This is simply our recognition of their authority to operate within the city of Milton right-of-way. Then we're we have no choice but to do. That's my position. That is correct. 
and then we're going to make them come in and apply under our telecommunications code uh, to work out the specifics of what that looks like and hopefully in the meantime we will be bringing forward to you a small cell ordinance to better capture the things we want looked at. Because I think we, a couple years ago, we dealt with this even on Bethany Bend because I think we've got some of the lower ones already out there and we were thinking that would be, sound like a good alternative instead of fighting cell towers, you could have them put on utility poles. This is a new technology that now we're dealing with much more prominent, almost double the height of the regular telephone pole. That's right. Okay, anybody else? All right, I'll uh, open up for a uh, motion. And Mr. Mayor, there is a resolution in your packet. Yep. Okay. Anybody want to make a, re uh, I'll a make motion a on the resolution? I'll make a motion that we approve agenda item number 16-275, the resolution to approve mobile lights, mobile, mobile lights, LLC application for utilization of the public rights of way of the city of Milton for telecommunication facilities as authorized by law. Second. Okay, I've got a motion from Councilmember Thurman, second. From Councilmember Longoria, any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That's unanimous. Okay, Sudi, if you'd please call the next item. Next item is consideration of the City Council of the City of Milton declaring the results of an election determining the issuance of general obligation bonds by the City of Milton and for other related purposes. Agenda item number 16, 276, Mr. Ken Gerard. Mr. Mayor, Member Council, this is always the good stuff. Uh, this is a resolution that our bond attorneys have asked us to put in front of you that is part of the validation process with respect to our geo debt. Uh, this is just simply one of the many pieces of paper we'll have to do with respect to presenting that packet to the Superior Court judge for validation. But this is our resolution declaring formally the results of the GEO bond referendum. If the adoption of this resolution will simply ratify that which has already been confirmed by the Fulton County Board of Elections, which is that the City of Milton's GEO bond resolution did pass with the yeses bringing in 82.86% and the noes bringing in 17.14%. So that's a fairly... Uh, significant win uh, for the city of Milton with respect to the geo bond. So in any event, this resolution does need to be adopted, um, and I'm here for any questions. Okay. It's pretty cut, <coughs> cut and dry, but cut and any dry. questions? Okay. Yes. I think uh, citizens spoke loud and clear. I'll open up for a motion. I'll make a motion to approve agenda item 16276. <coughs> Second. Okay, I have a motion, uh, motion from... Councilmember Hewitt, second from Councilmember Moore. Um, any discussion? Approval. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimous. Okay, we'll uh, move on to reports. Anything Council wants to bring up? Okay, I'll move on to staff. Our staff reports, starting with community development. Um, there are three initiatives related to the strategic plan that I'd like to bring up this evening. Um, the first one uh, pertains to creating a master plan for the downtown Milton. Um, I would like to um, pass on to you that the final presentation on this uh, master plan will be held on November 30th at the Milton Library. Um, and this is a uh, f review of, by the public, a public hearing of the final draft. Um, it will not be the last time it will be before the public, however, because subsequent to this meeting, it will then move on to the Planning Commission, and then it is anticipated that it will come to the City Council um, in February of 17. Next is the update to the Tree Preservation Ordinance. Um, we did hold a kickoff meeting on October 26 with the Planning Commission and other stakeholders were in attendance, and the consultant is currently working on uh, on this ordinance for us. And then lastly uh, is the, the last initiative I want to mention is to review the potential of asking the public to consider a bond issue for the conservation type purposes. And as was just discussed, the, the bond issue passed and the, um, we did hold a work session last week to talk about the composition of the advisory board uh, that will be um, 
utilize to um, advise the council on potential land acquisition as, as we move forward. I do have several text amendments, the status of which I'd like to review with you in terms of when they will come b before you for your review. The, the first is uh, a, an amendment to create a steep slopes, to create steep slope standards. Um, and that um, has been reviewed by the Planning Commission at their November meeting. They are, want to also review it next month, so it's anticipated that um, it will come before you in January. Next is um, consideration to amend the AG1 district regarding paved and unpaved roads. Uh, that is anticipated to come before you next month. In addition to that, the related definitions as they relate to paved and unpaved roads will also follow that and will be before you as well next month. Uh, also before you next month will be consideration to amend the Deerfield form based code and this relates to the moratorium, uh, the, the two moratoriums that are in place as it relates to the prohibition of residential uses on the Route 9 corridor. So th that will, as I mentioned before you next month. Um, in addition, um, the, there will be an amendment to consider uh, amending the rural Milton overlay as it relates to, to the height of single family uses. And this is an amendment that is being handled basically in tandem with the retaining wall um, uh, of, of, of amendment that you, you passed. Next is a consideration to amend the Crab Apple form based code as it relates to building units allowed for parking structures. Uh, this is essentially a loophole that we found in the Crab Apple Code that we would like to correct. Um, next um, is the um, revision to the plat process, Chapter 50, uh, as it relates to s subdivisions. The language for this is being prepared, um, and um, it is anticipated that the uh, council will review it in February. Lastly, we have a use permit that has started through the process. This is a permit um, at 2785 Francis Road by Chrysalis Experimental Academy to consider a use permit for a private school with a maximum of 25 students within the existing structure, as well as a concurrent variance to reduce the undisturbed buffer. Uh, the CZIM meeting was held last week, and it will go on to DRB and then on to PC and in their de December meetings and then come to the council in the, your January meeting. So that's what's on the docket so far. So. Okay, any questions for Kathy? <coughs> on uh, items seven, eight, and nine, supposed to come in front of us on the 19th of next month. Are we gonna discuss those in the prior work session? Yes, okay. yes. Yeah, I, I, what I just relate here is the, is the final vote, but yes, absolutely, all these, We'll always come to you for the work session first, and then I'll take over. Thank you. Okay, take next parks and recreation. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, Several things, exciting things to report. Um, we have completed our fall programming. Uh, the uh, boys lacrosse, girls lacrosse, and baseball all experienced increases in participation. And that's exciting, we're moving in the right direction there. Football did not have an increase. They, they actually fell back a little bit. But interestingly enough, football is uh, got one team that's still alive and they're playing this weekend for a uh, league championship. So we're pretty excited with the Milton Steelers. Uh, we did have a meeting with all of our program partners this past Thursday, and we shared common ideas on how do we can work together, you know, what's working in their programs for good, what's, what's not working. We had our concession stand operator there and was able to give feedback on, you know, from their perspective how things are going. It was a very constructive meeting. It's one of the things we're trying to do under the uh, strategic plan initiatives here. Uh, also, we have formal requests in to the Fulton County Board of Education to start our, our uh, renew the IGA process at uh, Birmingham Falls, Cochran Woods, and Hopewell Middle School. And uh, it is, uh, Fulton County's confirmed they have in their hands and they're working through their processes. 
want to let you know that our basketball program we took a huge jump this year we have consistently been in the one hundred to one hundred ten kids in the program and this year we're currently at one hundred ninety nine kids we can find one more at least on the garage yeah Steve what's your kid doing but now we are uh, we're close. I mean, it, in uh, this, what we're seeing here, the reason with the basketball jump is uh, three years ago we made a, a change in our program provider, and uh, we went with halftime sports, and halftime sports has been consistent. We have been consistently running our summer camp. Two years ago we started our fall basketball program. It was more of a uh, open uh, open gym type activities. And uh, also, Halftime Sports also now has a contract to be managing Milton High School's basketball, junior basketball programs. So we now have synergy all the way from kindergarten all the way to high school, all under the Halftime banner. And uh, Halftime Sports has continued and demonstrated that they are uh, honoring the commitment they've made to us, and it's working. It's working. I was fortunate able to pick up gym space over at uh, uh, Crab Apple Crossing, and we need it. And uh, next year I'll be in the hunt for more uh, gymnasium space. But the basketball program finally looks like it's going the way we want it to go. We're very excited about that. As you all know, Providence Park is open. And I do want to take you uh, a moment to say thank you to all of you for uh, supporting the contract for the uh, bridge and dock work we're going to be doing. We'll get going on that right away. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. I had the opportunity, Tom uh, McElveen and I had the opportunity. We were invited this past Friday to the Atlanta Cricket League's annual banquet. And Joe, you remember when we had the tournament out there, and uh, it was a lot of fun. It was a huge, there was over 500 people there, and uh, there was a lot of really good food. I couldn't tell you what it was, uh, but, it, <laughs> but it was good. We had a great time, and they let us know that uh, one of the things they did at the end of their season is they had a uh, banquet as a fund, uh, they had a, a tournament as a fundraiser. And uh, part of the money they raised, they sent over to an orphanage in India. And the other part they gave to the city of Milton, a check for $2,000 to help us with Camp Dreadful Souls for next year as the appreciation of the Atlanta Cricket League you know, to the city of Milton. Okay? And then the last thing I want to let you know is we can now truly say we are an award-winning Parks and Rec program uh, this year at the District 7 level in the category of population category of 20,001 to 50,000. The city of Milton was named District uh, Agency of the Year, District 7 Agency of the Year. All right. All right. Congratulations all, right. all you. Thank you for all you do to make this program go. Thank you. Good Any job. questions? Yes, sir. Jim, so <coughs> congratulations on all the success. It's Good all of us. Hear. It's all of us. It's, you know, Carter, Stacy, Steve, everybody here. It's, I was real excited to hear about the basketball program, but it begs a question. Yes, sir. We've got basketball synergy. Things are going well. Mm -hmm. The program's expanding. Yes. We had a real difficult discussion and vote a couple of years ago related to the football program. Yes. How much of the football program's success or challenges is is due to some kind of lack of synergy? And is there something we're doing to see if we can't explore or find that synergy? Well, we certainly are trying to work with them. We, we've uh, offered them a contract again for next year. We want to try and get them drive going. The Milton Stewart's program has had some challenges, uh, but I think it's too early yet. We've, it's only been the two years that they've been our program provider. Uh, I think we have to take a good hard look at them for this upcoming year. Uh, they're trying really hard. I mean, they, they really are trying to expand their programs. I think it is it's, it's not an unfair statement to say that parents are still concerned about the concussion issue. Okay. And I think that's the biggest thing that's working against them. Okay. All right. Thank you. Again, thank you very much, Jim. That's uh, great news. Hey, thank you all. I, like I said, uh, this is the best job I've ever had, and I thank you all for it. Thanks for the support, all of you. Thank you. Okay. Communications now. Jim. Clearly, it's going to come down a little bit. So, uh, it, how tough is it to follow an award-winning uh, Parks and Rec program when you're only 60 days into the job? But I'll give it my best shot. 
Um, I'd like to focus tonight's presentation on three sort of um, three segments. Uh, reporting and data, uh, a report that you're accustomed to getting from communications. Um, structure and organization in terms of how communications and com outreach and engagement are structured now and how we're working together. Um, and then some next steps for me specifically as it relates to communications. Um, in front of you, you should have the communications, the monthly stats. Um, in general, I won't um, get into the details or the weeds of it. The numbers are the numbers. But I do want to point out that when I first started, I looked at some of the data to confirm that the numbers that I saw were accurate with what were reflected on Google Analytics. So you will see a few changes if you have an old report compared to now. Um, you'll also see that I've added a category where we look at active users because those are unique um, website visitors and I think that's a better reflection of the activity that's going on on the website. And then I've also looked at total sessions where you're looking at meaningful engagement with a user. Um, so you're excluding those visits that don't average two minutes. So you're really looking at those meaningful stops on your pages um, to look at that. Um, the social media, the numbers are the numbers. What I would tell you is that those numbers don't mean anything unless people are engaging with us. You see that there's growth, which is great. That's what you always want to see. Um, and so that's good. But what we want to look at is how are our residents engaging with us? Are they commenting? Are they sharing? Um, are they um, offering mentions of the city and engaging with us? Not just passive, I like your page, I follow you. So we really want to look at how we're engaging them. And I'm seeing an uptick. And that's great. That's good news. Um, in terms of email, the category that's on there, you'll see the data is missing. It took me a while to figure out what this data source might be. Um, and what I figured out is that those are the number of um, email recipients that have signed up, who've actively shown an interest, gone online to the website, filled out the online form to say, send me the e-newsletter. And so you'll see that there's growth, um, or I'll, I can tell you that there's growth now that I've figured out the data source. So we're at 4,146. What I would propose going forward is that that's not a, it's a number and I want to share it with you, um, but it's not as meaningful as talking with you about unsubscribe rates. So in other words, are we putting out um, electronic communications that the messaging, they're not interested or they're unsubscribing, they feel like it's noise. So we're having meaningful interactions. If you see your unsubscribe rates go up, that means that they don't really particularly feel like the information is useful, it doesn't apply to them. And so what I can tell you anecdotally, anecdotally right now is that we have very low unsubscribe rates that I've seen since I've been here and the e-blast that we're pushing, so that's good. Um, and then also, I want to talk about average open rates because it's not enough that we communicate electronically with our residents. If we push it out and they don't open it, it means that the message wasn't compelling, the subject line didn't engage them, um, so we want to look at that. And so our, up, our open rates are actually higher than the average, the standards. So we have anywhere from 27 to a 34% open rate, which is really good when you talk about e-marketing standards. Um, Lastly, um, when you talk about organic reach, so we have those raw data numbers. So what I look at on social media is organic reach is unpaid reach. So we don't have ads, we don't pay to boost posts. Um, and what I can say is that we have really good organic reach with our messaging because we're having increased engagement. So that's a positive and I won't bore you with the, with the details of that. Second piece in terms of structure and organization. Um, communications is a little, little bit different structure than I think what um, has historically been in place. Um, Courtney, who you heard from last week, is focused on community outreach and engagement. Um, obviously, um, we have very distinct roles to play. Courtney is focusing on those areas while I'm focusing more on traditional communications, whether it's website, news releases, electronic communications social media and obviously we have to collaborate and work um, closely together um, but that sort of gives you the structure of how we're working together and where sort of my area falls and where Courtney's but obviously our core values are collaboration so we're doing that and working really well together 
Um, finally, so what's next? I've been here 60 days. Um, what's on the horizon? I'm looking at the strategic plan. So each week you hear, obviously, um, department reports, and they're talking about um, updates for their department specific, specific to the strategic plan. So what I'm looking at is those goals and objectives and those individual department initiatives and where I can plug in and support and enhance through communi different communication tactics. Um, and then I'm also looking at the overall strategic plan to develop communication specific goals and objectives and initiatives that will align with what was already done when I arrived here. So that, that plan that you already have in place. Um, another thing um, I hope to do is I hope to engage the community in a survey of some sort so that we can figure out how do residents want to get their information from us. You know, digital um, media is wonderful. It puts information at our fingertips. Um, but at the same time, it segments our audience, which makes it sometimes very difficult to reach different um, um, populations. So are we actually giving them the information that they want um, in a manner in which they want to receive it? Um, and then finally, this is a little bit further out, I'd look, like to look at our website um, to make sure that it adheres to best practice. What I can tell you initially on my initial assessment is it's a little deep. You know, we want it to be best practices. It needs to be a little bit flatter. You need to get them to the information a little bit more quickly. Um, but I think it's, it's good overall, and that will sort of be further down the line. In general, what I see my role, obviously, is proactive communication that cultivates transparency um, and engages residents and that's responsive. And so everything that I will do going forward, obviously, will employ those things and the strategies that I do. So that's it in a nutshell after six day, 60 days, but I'm happy to take any questions. Joe? So, um, Google Analytics. Yes. Obviously, there's a lot of information that we can gain from that. Yes. It would be good to see some of that data here. Yep. In fact, and, you know, it's certain ironies here because your communications, and this mm -hmm. is a, you know, piece of communication, mm -hmm. we could do a little bit better. Absolutely. In terms of what we are saying. Yes. Here. I um, would wholeheartedly agree that is a format and a template that the, my predecessor right. um, delivered. But what I hope to be able to provide is a much more robo robust picture um, that you have in front of you in advance that talks about the ways that we're engaging, um, what the sort of general feedback gives you some real life examples, whether it's snippets of comments um, from social media, whether it's particular emails about, so a good example might be, um, an email where we simply pushed out um, information, fire safety information about the dehumidifiers. Um, and the two emails that I got back from residents who said, I have one. So just those sort of supportive documents, but also Google Analytics, we, we need to do a better job of giving you a better picture, and that's what I hope to be able to do. Right. Um, and obviously, the social media components, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, that's not all inclusive. I know you guys probably have programs that go that utilize more channels than that. Mm -hmm. But it'd be good to, because I mean, to me, Facebook 4285 in January doesn't mean anything to me because there's number of subscribers, mm -hmm. there's a number of people are posting, there's a number of yep. people that are responding to things that we put out there. There's a whole wealth of information that, mm -hmm. that would be good to know because, you know, that gets mm -hmm. directly to citizen engage, engagement, or Absolutely. at least it's the foundation for that one type of engagement anyway, mm -hmm. so, right. so that would be good. Um, your, the open rates issue that you talked about, mm -hmm. is that something that we're measuring on our own? Beca or, because I know we don't, or, we're not using any kind of in-mail or, or we We are, we're using constant tools. contact. Oh, we are? Mm -hmm. okay. We are, All right. yes. Never mind then, mm -hmm. I'm good. We do, so those are click-through rates, open rates, all that's uh, readily available. Um, but yes, I, what I plan for is a more robust picture of what's going on, not just raw numbers. The raw numbers don't tell you anything. I, you know, I tell, I, I teach social media through UGA's Carl Vince Institute of Government, and I tell my classes all the time, if you have a, mil a million followers, it means nothing if they're not engaging with you. It's much better to have, I'd rather have a thousand followers who are actively engaged, having a conversation, um, positive and negative feedback than just a million passive right. uninvolved. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. You're right. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. As we added to our agenda, an uh, executive session to discuss land acquisition, do I have a motion to move into it? So moved. 
Second. I have a motion and a second to move into an executive session to discuss land acquisition. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That's unanimous. Senator.
each other up up here. Okay, do I have a motion to reconvene? So moved. Second. We have a motion to second. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Be opposed? Unanimous. Um, Steve, you have some reports. Go ahead. Just some real quick stuff. I just want to uh, bring you up to date. The uh, Chadwick Landfill Fire um, Fire Department did a great job out there. That, uh, once again, I, I, we do need to get to the bottom of why that place can spontaneously combust every now, so often. Is this the older one, the one that happened a while back, or did another one happen recently? No, we, the one that I the one that I reached out to you about on Saturday. I was thinking it was across the street. Okay. So so it's so, so no. So this is the second time. Yeah, se the second time since I've been in this position yeah. that this landfill's gone up, and especially right now with the conditions we have, this could have been disastrous. Fire department did a great job. We got wow. some help from Alpharetta and uh, Cherokee County on it, and uh, we need to get to the bottom of, of this. The fire department did good. They always do a great I don't job. Know what the police were, but. Good thing we didn't let any cops around them. We've just gone up. <laughs> Um, but it is, uh, it is, uh, it is clearly an issue that we need to get the bottom of. We, where I came from, we had a landfill. I don't remember that place going burning once, so I don't know what is going on why this place continually combusts. Um, but maybe a bunch of you people from up north can come down here and tell us how to do I it. I knew I set myself up for that. <laughs> um, or maybe we just kept the fires quiet. I have no idea. But either way, um, it uh, we do need to figure out. November 26th, this Saturday, from 6 to 7, um, down at Webb and Highway 9, we have our uh, Christmas tree lighting. We'll have the Milton High School Choir down there um, doing Christmas carols, Santa, hot chocolate. Uh, I, think, I think I'm not going to shock you, but it looks like it's not supposed to rain. Um, so it looks like we'll have a, uh, have a great day for it. Um, just to give you a heads up, because we have a couple of weeks now, uh, December 1st, the 10th anniversary, Five to seven, Broadwell Pavilion. Um, we have a great lineup. Uh, a lot of invitations went out. We're hearing a lot of uh, great responses. Uh, program looks good. I think, it's, I think it'll be a great time. Yeah, I've, uh, I've asked uh, Jan Jones and, and Ron Wallace to say a few words. And uh, McPherson Corn, if you guys from that, that were here from the beginning, he's going to be there too. You're going to close the road for that event? Do you have that much of a I response? I don't know that we're going to need to close the close the road. Well, we know we have adequate parking. I'll have officers there to make sure people get a, get to and from. Um, December third, Christmas crab apple. Uh, it's with CCA two to five. Also at Broadwell Pavilion, Santa caroling, s'mores, pictures with Santa, um, and then just a little bit longer term, December tenth, pancake uh, breakfast uh, with Santa over at the firehouse forty three. So it just amazing. was great. That one was like one of the most popular things. People showed up. And that was huge. That. Last year. December, that's December 10th. That is December 10th. Is the tour of homes. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Good to know. Well, Thank you. I appreciate that. The number of people doing the tour of homes. Tour of homes. <laughs> what, 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 what's, yeah, what, I guess, is there overlap from the time? Tour of homes. The first tour is at 945. The second tour is at 1. 130. Yeah. And what time does the. This is 8 to 10. Well, hey, go, go pancake breakfast. You'll be well fed when you get That's on the right. tour if you do the early one. Hopefully they wash their hands before they touch people's furniture. Okay. Um, that's all I got. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank um, you. Do I have a motion to? M motion to adjourn. Motion to second. All oh. quick. Third. Done. Who's, the, who's second? I did. Bert. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Unanimous. Have a happy Thanksgiving. Wow.